The actual number that's associated with K will tell you if the reaction has more products or if it has more reactants. If your actual numeric value of K is larger than one, that means you have a product favored equilibrium. And that means that at equilibrium, you're gonna end up with more products than you have reactants. On the other hand, if your K value is less than one, that means you're gonna have a reactant favored equilibrium. And at equilibrium in those cases, you're gonna end up with more reactants than you have products. Now, a couple of things. K, again, is never going to be zero or negative, all right? K, if it's less than one, will be a number larger than zero, but less than one, okay? If K is larger than one, it will, of course, be larger than one, but it can go up really, really high, and we'll see numbers that are really, really big. Also, we're going to see some Ks that are really, really small. So just FYI, always positive numbers, but they are all over the place. Here's an example. That reaction we looked at earlier with nitrogen and three hydrogen gases making two ammonias, the K value, which is a KC by the way, 3.5 times 10 to the eighth. So ask yourself, is K larger than one or less, greater than one or less than one? And definitely this K much greater than one. So that means this K is gonna be a product favored equilibrium. And once equilibrium is established, we would expect there to be more ammonia around than you'd have nitrogen and hydrogen. So again, look at the value of K and this K is much larger than one. You're gonna have a product favored equilibrium, more ammonia less N2 and H2. Nitrogen monoxide does not react with water. When it contacts oxygen in the air, however, the reaction is almost instantaneous and produces the brown gas, nitrogen dioxide. The reaction is so product favored that a chemist would say that it has gone to completion, a fact reflected by its very large equilibrium constant. Product favored reactions are good to go. You see something instantly when they react, and that's a really cool thing. Now, it is still a little bit based on kinetics. All right, kinetics is literally how fast and slow things go, but usually, assuming the kinetics are reasonable, <laughs> which most of the things we look at are, okay, then you see something happen, all right? Like you see the brown gas here forming. Uh, so, product favored are usually what people want when they're trying to make something. Here's a reaction. It's silver chloride, which is a solid, and it bre it's breaking down into the ions, silver plus and chloride. So this K, which is a KC now, because these are solutions, the silver ion concentration times the chloride ion concentration, 1.8 times 10 to the minus five, a pretty small number. Now this K, as you can see, is a lot less than one. So that means that this reaction is gonna be very reactant phase. Once equilibrium kicks in, you're going to have more AgCl solid around, then you're going to have silver ions and chloride ions. So again, literally the value of K will tell you if K is greater than one, more product. This K is much less than one, so we're going to have more reactant. Remember, K will never be zero and never be negative, but they can get really, really, really small. This is a pretty small one. That means you're going to have more AgCl, then you'll have Ag+. Plus and Cl minus. We talked about earlier, if you flip a reaction, reactants become products, products become reactants, you go one over the old K to get the new K. So you can also think about this reaction as silver ions and chloride ions making AgCl solid, all right? If you do that, to find the new K, you would go one over the old K, it would be 5.6 times 10 to the fourth. So notice by flipping the reaction, K becomes greater than one product favored. So in this version down here, K is greater than one product favored, you'd expect AGCL to dominate over the AG plus and CL minus. 
On the other hand, up here with the initial reaction, K was much less than one, that means you'd expect more reactant AgCl than Ag plus or Cl minus. So both ways tell you the same thing. But because K is different, that also is just a highlight for me and a warning. Make sure that you always write equilibrium constants in the same way because reversing a reaction will give you what looks like a different number. The chemistry is okay, it's just you have to realize there's different ways of thinking about it. Here's some graphs that show what happens when you have a product favored or reactant favored K. If you have a K greater than one, then that means that your products here on the left will be in a bigger concentration, y-axis, than the reactants, all right? That means more products, less reactants, K is greater than one. On the other hand, if you have a K less than one, then you have more reactants than you have products, all right? So you can see in this graph now, reactants started high and they did go down, but they didn't go as down nearly as much as the product side, as the product favorite K did. Notice that in both reactant and product favorite, you do have reactants and products, all right? Nothing is zero in these, but it's the relative amounts that make the big difference. So the left-hand side, product favored K greater than one, the right side, reactant favored, more reactants than products form, uh, K is less than one. Here are some reactions. First one, 2NO2 is going to N2O4, K value 180. The second one is iron 2 hydroxide, FeOH2, a solid, breaking down to iron 2 plus and 2 hydroxides, K value 7.9 times 10 to the minus 15th. And it says which statement is true. So only one of these apparently. So A, both reactants are product favored. Remember that for product favored, you must have a K greater than one. The first one is definitely the case, K 180. That's larger than one. So A is definitely product favored. But B, the second reaction, 7.9 times 10 to the minus 15th, that's much less than one. That one's going to be a reactant favored K. So A is not true. The second one is not react, is not product favored. And likewise, B is not going to be correct either. Because while B, the iron uh, two hydroxide reaction, is reactant favored, A, the first one, the N NO2 reaction is very product favored. So if you look at C, it says reaction A is product favored, reaction B is reactant favored. That sounds good to me. Answer C would be correct. And again, the answer to answer this problem, you literally look at the value of K. If K is larger than one product favored, K less than one, it's reactant favored. Pretty chill. The reaction quotient Q is also something that can be helpful to chemists studying in equilibrium. And all reacting chemical systems have a reaction quotient Q. And Q can be a little weird because Q looks the same as an equilibrium constant, constant K expression. So just like K, which is products over reactants, Q is products over reactants. And just just like K, Q, you want to raise all products and reactants to their stoichiometries. So little c, little d, little a, little b, etc., etc. But why the reaction quotient is helpful to chemists is that if you have a known value of K, the known value of equilibrium, you can take a sample of your own chemical system and essentially calculate a type of Q, all right? It's products divided by reactants, same thing. If your Q, the measurement you take, is equal to K, then your system's at equilibrium and you're good to go. But what happens on a lot of reactions where you need a Q is that the reaction is slower, all right? And you're not sure if your system's at equilibrium or not. So if you measure your products and reactants to get a Q value, and you find that Q and K are different numbers, then that means your system is not at equilibrium. So you can think about Q as a way to test if your chemical system has achieved equilibrium or not. A lot of times, Q and K, no problem, because the reaction is pretty fast getting to equilibrium. But if you have a reaction which is slower, then knowing Q and comparing it to 
a known value of K, by the way, will help you to see if your reaction's at equilibrium. To use Q, you must know what K is. All right, that's really the most effective way. If you're the first person to ever study this chemical reaction, then you just have to take a lot of reactions over long periods of time and see if the reactants and products, i.e. your value of Q or K, changes, all right? Once it's a pretty constant, then you can say you know K. But at first, if you don't know, you just gotta do it. So the best way to use Q is if you have a known value of K, you do products divided by reactants to get a Q, and then you compare your Q to the known value of K to see if you're at equilibrium. Here's a reaction where again, H2 and I2 are combining to make 2HI. And we talked about earlier how once the products and reactants are constant, that's when you're gonna have the equilibrium. So earlier when I drew it, it was something like this right here. And everything to the right of that little weird thing I drew is equilibrium, but everything to the left is not equilibrium. Reactants and products are still stabilizing. So let's say you didn't know where you were in this graph, all right? You could be anywhere along the x-axis. If you were over here, then you wouldn't be at equilibrium. But if you'd allowed the reaction to progress to over here, then you would be at equilibrium. So this would be the time that you'd want to do a Q calculation. You would measure the HI and the H2 and I2 concentrations at that point along the x-axis, calculate Q, and compare your Q value to K. And again, Q is going to be HI squared divided by H2 and I2, same kind of form as K. Comparing Q and K, there's three possibilities. If Q and K are the same, if they're equal to each other, that means you're at equilibrium and you don't have to wait any longer. However, sometimes Q is less than K. This is, I think, the most common in these kind of scenarios. If Q is less than K, all right, then that means the reaction's going to shift to the products. You're going to make more product and more reactants will be used up. We're going to call this a shift shift to the right. If I say shift to the right, that means a shift to the products. And in a Q world, Q would be less than K. So again, what would happen here is if K will say was equal to 10, maybe your Q was four, a number less than K. So that tells you then that you'd have this kind of situation and more reactants are going to shift to the products. Once in a while, if you're starting with product and shifting to reactants, and this happens once in a while, then, and you calculate things, sometimes you'll have a Q that's greater than K. So if Q is greater than K, then that means that more products need to shift to reactants. This means the reaction's going to shift to the left. So Q less than K is fairly common if you're doing a Q calculation. It means you're not at equilibrium. Q equals K means you're at equilibrium. And once in a while, you'll have a Q which is greater than K. That means you're going to have more reactants, less products. If you need more reactants than products, then in the change part of the ice table, the reactants will have a positive and the products will have a negative. But what's more common by far is the first condition where Q is less than K. That means your products are going to have more of them formed. In the change part, the products would have an increase and the reactants would have a decrease. And we'll see this here in a little bit. Um, also, if I say shift to the right, that's going to mean more products. Shift to the left means more reactants. And again, we all have to be talking about the same form of the same reaction for that to make sense. Here's a reaction again with n-butane going to isobutane. Here's the Lewis structures actually drawn out. You can see the n-butane is truly a butane, a butyl group with all hydrogens around it. Isobutane is a methyl propane. Isobutane is like the common name. But anyway, in this reaction, the equilibrium constant's been studied pretty, uh, pretty well. The K value, 2.50. Now let's stop right there. 2.50 as a K is larger than 1. So once equilibrium establishes itself, you're going to have more product than reactant because K is a product favored K. It's larger than 1. So at equilibrium, we would expect to have more isobutane than butane. And that's kind of a neat thing. You can start to see how this stuff all works out.
So right away, from the value of K, you can tell if you're going to have more products or more reactants. This K is larger than 1, more products, we're going to have more isobutane than we have N-butane. So let's say that we have isobutane at 0.35 moles per liter and the N-butane, as I just abbreviated N right there, 0.15 molar, all right? Are we at equilibrium, okay? If you stop right there, all right, at this, this first question, what we wanna do here is we wanna actually calculate our Q, all right? We're not sure if we're at equilibrium. We know what the equilibrium constant is. So calculating Q will tell us if we're at equilibrium or not. And more often than not, in these kind of problems, you're, I guess you're not at equilibrium, we can use our Q and compare it to K to determine which way the reaction's going to shift. So let's see how this works. So first of all, Q, we need to calculate it. And Q has the same form as K. It's products over reactants, raise everything, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, it's isobutane divided by N-butane, 0.35 divided by 0.15. It comes out to be 2.3. Q, 2.3, is less than K, 2.50. So that means that Q and K are not the same. We are not at equilibrium. And because Q is less than K, that means Q has to become a bigger number. Bigger numbers mean more product, less reactant. Q is going to shift towards K. We're going to see a shift to the right. Anytime Q is less than K, that means you're going to have a shift to the right. More isobutane is going to form and less N-butane will be there. So when equilibrium is established, the isobutane will go up from 0.35 and we could figure out what it is, but it'll go to a larger number. And the N-butane will go from 0.15 molar to a smaller number. It's going to decrease as Q, the, or excuse me, as the products, the isobutane increases. Here's a reaction. Uh, N-butane to isobutane, again, at K at 2.5. We have an N-butane 0 0.020 and an isobutane 0 0.030. Is the reaction at equilibrium? Okay, so the first thing you got to do is figure out Q. Q is going to be isobutane divided by N-butane. And the concentrations we have, 0 0.030 divided by 0 0.020. So in the calculator, first thing I would do is mathematically, if you don't want to do it in your head, 0 0.03 divided by 0 0.02. That's like three halves. K is going to be 1.5. And 1.5, our Q, is certainly not K. So we're not at equilibrium. So if Q is 1.5, 1.5 will become more like 2.5 given enough time. And to make 1.5 more like 2.5, we need to make the numerator numerator bigger and the denominator smaller. So that means more isobutane, less N-butane. That means we're going to have more products than reactants when the shift occurs. But initially, we have too many reactants. Uh, so we need to turn some of them into products. Answer B here would be the right way. So again, here you can see mathematically, this is the value of Q. I just took products divided by reactants. Q and K are certainly not the same. Right now, we have too many reactants. We need to make more products. It's going to shift to the right side.